Well, good morning, everyone. I can see you're all glad to be here and to see one another. You know, that's one of the benefits that you don't get when you're watching online is this. Very, very good. Well, it's good to see you all here today. We're going to look into the Word of God today. We're in chapter 19 of the book of Genesis. We've been looking at what God has done in calling Abram and giving him promises, changing his name to Abraham and moving on from there. But before we get started, if you guys would just pray with me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be here. With all of the things outside of this room, I pray that you'd help them to fade away. Even the concerns and cares of our own minds and hearts. Lord, I pray that we would give you our full attention, that your word might find its home inside of us, that we would learn more about you, more about ourselves. I pray that you might help us to be shaped into your image. Lord, we need you. You are the great I am, the one who has always been, will always be, and is here with us now. And I pray that you help us, Lord, to hear your voice, each one of us, and what you need to speak to each one of us. We give you this time, Lord, and ourselves as your people, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So we're back in the book of Genesis, back in chapter 19, where we're going to look at the judgment of Sodom. Uh, you guys know the, the, the book of Genesis, and you're probably very familiar with Sodom. Any child that's been through Sunday school knows about Sodom and Gomorrah. It's one of those colossal and epic tales of how God judges people when uh, their judgment has reached its pinnacle and it was time, uh, and how God dealt with his people that were there. Last year, We looked at Abraham before we went through the, the Christmas season and New Year's. We were looking at Abraham and his three visitors, these mysterious three visitors that show up and he throws himself on the ground and greets them. And we know one of them is the pre-incarnate Lord Jesus Christ himself. And as we went through, I think we saw that these these visitors come to him and he throws himself on the ground and says, listen, stick around. Thank you for coming. Let me get you something to eat. And uh, sends his wife out to, to, to make some bread. And he you know, says, get busy making some bread for these guys. And he goes out and gets some yogurt, essentially, and a lamb and uh, serves them a non-kosher meal. The first Jew of all serving a non-kosher meal to a couple of angels. By the way, he asked her to mix, mix up 22 quarts of meal. I don't know if you know how much that is, but that's a whole, whole lot of food. Um, I, I always hate going to a place where they give you like a small plate and charge you like $90 and say, here you are, sir, this is the best that the chef has. And it's two entire bites of the most exquisite food you can ever have, you know. Give me a burger. I'd be good with that. Well, this was not fast food, and it was not a kosher meal, and they're entertaining them. And, of course, the, then the Lord speaks to him and says, listen, you're going to have a son. I'm going to come back, and in about a year's time, you're going to have a son. And, and Sarah kind of snickers in, in the back of her mind. She snickers about this. Come on, I'm an old woman. She's in her 90s. And uh, the Lord asks him, why did Sarah laugh? And she pops her head out of the tent. I, I didn't laugh. He goes, yeah, you did. <laughs> Which is a little scary because if you don't actually do something on the outside and somebody knows what you were thinking, that's kind of scary. God's like that. I'm glad the devil's not, but God is. And so they eventually go their way and they're heading out towards Sodom and two of them are going to go to Sodom. One is going to remain behind and have a conversation with him. And he says, shall I not tell Abraham what I'm about to do since he's going to have children and he's going to let everybody know what's going on here? And it's because he's going to carry that message to the next generation and downward that he gets told, which tells me that every bit of information, revelation is an accumulation and it's given to us for communication. 
So anything that God speaks to you, teaches to you, or shows to you is maybe not even for you. It might be for somebody else. You might be carrying mail to someone else. Amen? So sometimes you go through difficulty and you're just carrying mail to the next person. And then he announces, uh, you know, these guys are on their way down to Sodom to destroy the city and they're going to take it out. And he goes, really? You're kidding me, right? And he thinks, my nephew's there. His family's there. His wife and his daughters are there. And so he begins to give the Lord the third degree and say, listen, uh, it, it, you, you, the God of the entire universe would not be unfair. He would not destroy the innocent with the guilty, right? And that's kind of an assumption that Abraham knows. And he's now quizzing the Lord about this. And he says, if there's 50 righteous people, you're going to destroy the city with 50 righteous people in it? And the Lord says, no, if there's 50 righteous people, I won't destroy the city. And he goes, well, what if there's five less? What if there's 45 people? Would you destroy the city for 45? And he begins to haggle with him, which is, which is a characteristic thing of Abraham and his people. I'm just saying, have you never been to New York? And so he says, well, what if there's five less? Well, what if there's 40? Well, what if there's 30? Well, what if there's 20? And he gets down to 10 and he goes, one more time, one more time, this is it. What if there's only 10 righteous people? And I think Lot figured he pushed his luck enough. And it's interesting because he gets the same exact answer every time. If there's 50, if there's 45, if there's 30, if there's 20, if there's 10, I will not destroy the city for 10. He probably could have went all the way down to one. I don't think the God, the God of the universe would not destroy the innocent with the guilty, would destroy that place if there was one righteous person. And so that's the whole reason of their coming, because they're going to go there and they're going to get a lot out of there before judgment falls, because it doesn't belong on him. And so... The Lord went away, and as soon as he had finished speaking with Abram, and Abraham returned to his place. And so that's where we closed out last year with the two of the three moving on, and the Lord speaking with Abraham and him going away. And so now we pick up the action in chapter one. I want to give you a warning right away for any of you who may be triggered. The following text involves judgment, violence, death, angels, homosexuality, rape, drunkenness, incest, and feasting. Yes, we're reading the Bible today. This isn't your local high school, although there's a lot of similarities. Judgment comes to the city of Sodom. Verse 1, now the two angels came to Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. And Lot saw them, and he rose to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground, and he said, Here now, my lords, please turn in to your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet, and then you may rise early and go your way. And they said, No, but we will spend the night in the open square. But he insisted strongly, so that they turned in to him and entered his house. And then he made them a feast, I warned you. And baked unleavened bread, and they ate. So we have the visitation of these two angels, which just came from Abraham and Hebron, by the way. And now they've gone to Sodom, where Lot has made his way into the city gate. The city gate is essentially the, the seat of government. So he's one of the, he might be the comptroller or whatever, the CEO or the mayor or one of his guys. But he's in the city, running the city. He's no longer on the outside He's now on the inside, and he's actually up on the upper echelons. So they come in. He sees them come in because he's at the city gate, and there's something unusual about these two, something that he noticed right away, just like Abraham noticed right away. And he says, listen, you, you guys look too good <laughs> to, to stay here in this city. I'm kind of embarrassed to be here myself, but let me take you into my house for the night. And they go... No, it's okay. We got reservations at the Motel 8 over here. We're going we're gonna to stay in the city square overnight. Now, if you know anything about the reputation of this place, they name a particular act after the town. And so he realizes these men, and they appear to be men, 
are not going to be safe in the city square. And so he basically rescues them uh, from being assaulted. And so he insists and he gets busy, his wife presumably helping about the house and getting food ready and they sit down and they eat. Sounds a whole lot like Abraham and practicing that sort of hospitality. Verse four, now before they lay down, before the end of the night, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both old and young, all the people from every quarter surrounded the house. And they called to Lot and said to him, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may know them carnally. So Lot went out to them through the doorway and shut the door behind him and said, please, my brethren, do not do so wickedly. These two tall, strong, handsome, attractive angels attracted the attention of the men in the city. And it says that all the men of the city from young to old. It's bad enough when you practice something that's terrible. It's worse when you encourage your children. Everyone is involved here. It's the entire city. And Lot understands what's happening. So he says, listen, I know these people. Let me go talk to them. And so he sneaks out the door and shuts the door behind him. And he says, brethren, Lot, supposedly a righteous man, is calling these people his brothers. Lot is so assimilated into this evil culture that he's one of them. He's saying they're just like he is. We're brothers. Do you see how twisted He's gotten in that town where these people are now accepted and okay. And he calls them brothers. They're not his brothers. And the angels are there to destroy the town because of their behavior. And yet that's how he approaches them as brothers. They're not brothers. But that's how close he is. And so they assault the door, and it's, it's a riot. And, you know, there's no controlling when you get into a riot, and there are always crazy people that are mixed in there with the riot, and everyone has their own intention. And so Lot, continuing to talk to them, says, See now, I have two daughters who have not known a man. Well, no wonder in this town. Please let me bring them out to you, and you may do to them as you wish. Only do nothing to these men, since this is the reason that they have come under the shadow of my roof, is to be protected. And they said, stand back. And they said, this one came in to stay here, and he keeps acting as a judge. Now, we will deal worse with you than with them. And so they pressed hard against the man Lot and came near to break down the door. It's at this point that Lot says, what am I doing here? (laughs) He tries to reason with the crowd. And he says, listen, these guys are, I'm entertaining, okay? And in, in, in that Eastern culture, hospitality was a sacred thing. And you were responsible for the people under your roof. And that's without, you know, homeowner's insurance. You are responsible for the people under your roof. And Lot number one, calling them brethren, number two, offers them his virgin daughters and says, you may have them instead and do what you wish to them? What the heck is going on? Would any of you do that? Because if so, I have to have a conversation with you. I need to calm down first. It's messed up. I'm just going to say it the way I see it. It's messed up. Where does he get the idea that it's better for his daughters to be raped and maybe murdered than it is for these two strangers? I'm going to be conservative and say his values are a bit off. And it's because he's been soaking in the stew of Sodom. Do you understand the danger for us? 
Do you understand the danger of that one-eyed monster we call a television? And the media? And it being controlled and spun? Depending on what channel you listen to, they'll spin it in any direction they want. We're soaking in Sodom, people. We have to be careful we don't become like Lot and suddenly sacrifice our family and think that it's okay because it's publicly accepted. And so we have to go along with what everyone else says. Wrong. Jesus said, or I'm sorry, Paul said something in 1 Corinthians 10, 11. Now these things happened to them as an example. They were written down for our instruction upon whom the end of the ages has come. You see, Paul recognizes not everything in the Bible is to be followed like this. Not everything in the Bible is, hey, this is a perfect world and this is the way everything should be. No, it shows us the dirty underbelly of humanity. And this is what happens when we allow our culture to tell us what's right and wrong. Amen? Amen. Verse 10. But the men, by the way, these angels appear as men, and you never see angels appear anything other than men. In case you see female angels and warrior princesses with wings and all that. Not in the Bible. But men reached out their hands and pulled Lot into the house with them and shut the door. And they struck the men who were in the doorway of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they became weary trying to find the door. And the men said to Lot, have you, have, do you have anyone else here? Son-in-law, your sons, your daughters, whomever you have in the city, take them out of this place, for we will destroy this place because the outcry against them has grown great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. So they disclosed their mission. We're on a journey. We're here to destroy and level this place. Get out. Get all your people out. Is there anyone that you love? Is there anyone that you care about? Is there any fruit of your ministry here in this town? He's kind of coming up empty. These are the best bouncers you want to have around, a couple of angels. Because they reached out the door, they yanked Lot in and closed the door, and these guys couldn't open the door. And then they struck them all with blindness. I find that metaphorically interesting because they were already spiritually blind, weren't they? He just struck them with physical blindness. It reminded me of Romans chapter 1 where, the, where Paul goes over this progress of God letting people go and giving them over. They have these desires that become twisted and natural desires become twisted. And then he gives them up to a depraved mind, which is to think on things in such a twisted fashion. And then they go to the next level because that's the way addiction is. And whatever it is you're trying to fill up with, if it's not Christ, it's some addiction. And the final level is, is these incredible desires that you can't even control anymore and you're out of control. And not only do you practice it, but you encourage other people to do so as well. And that's where these guys were. Complete and utter blindness to where your conscience is seared with a hot iron. That's why it's so tough to compromise and just, well, you know, I don't have to, you know, it's not really that important to do everything the Bible says. I mean, nobody's perfect. I'm only human. So are you. My goodness you start to veer off and go in that direction, there's no telling where you'll end up. But blindness is definitely the end. And so here they are like night of the living dead, try, groping around, trying to find the door, and they're still trying to get in. It's the amazing thing. They're struck blind by these guys, and they're still trying to get to the door and try to get in. Like, get a clue, Right? Verse 14, so Lot went out and he spoke to his sons-in-law. Now, he had sons-in-law who had married his daughters. 
and there's conjecture as to whether he had a couple other daughters or whether these men were engaged to his daughters, much like Joseph and Mary, where they were engaged. They were called married, but they didn't consummate, so they weren't really married. They were engaged, which is as good as gold because it's a contract. So, who had married his daughters and said, get up, get out of this place, for the Lord will destroy the city. But to his sons-in-law, he seemed to be joking. But the morning dawned, and the angels urged Lot to hurry, saying, Arise, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, lest you be consumed in the punishment of the city. And while he lingered, he lingered? While he lingered, the men took hold of his hand, his wife's hand, and the hands of his two daughters, and the Lord being merciful to him, and they brought him out and set him outside the city. Get your people and get out. He goes to his sons-in-law, and they laugh at him. They, what do you mean God's going to destroy the city? That's hilarious. What do you mean Jesus is coming again? You're kidding me, right? You really don't believe that stuff. I mean, it's nice you go to church and you're a good person and you give and all that stuff, but really you believe Jesus is going to come back for you? Really? That's hilarious. That's the way we're received sometimes, isn't it? But you see, his sons-in-law, these guys that he's giving his daughters to, presumably, they're not believers. As far as I'm concerned, that guy's got a strike three. He can't be an elder in this church. Or, or you think it'd be okay? You think it'd be okay? You think it'd be all right? We'll let him preach next week. Whack. Anyway, listen, I have to fight the same battle that you do so that I don't get pressed into this world's mold. Amen? Amen. So his, son, his sons-in-law laugh at him, and he says, I, I got to get out of here. The angel said, get out of here. Take the daughters you have here with you and go. And he stood there and lingered. He didn't go anywhere. He didn't do anything. He just stood there. The angels grab his hand. Now, I don't know about you, but another man grabbing my hand, that's a little weird. You got to grab my hand and pull me out like it's a burning building. The angels say, Let's go. Got to go. No more waiting. No more trying to talk to people. Time for talk is over. There's no more warning anyone. We're done. We're out of here. Grabs them by the hand. Eat. Notice it mentions him, his wife, and his two daughters. Good thing that there are two angels. They got four hands. They're yanking them out of the city, and they're heading for the door. Of course, they're probably still over some people that are... Uh, looking on the wall, and so they're headed for the door, and they're on their way out of the city. Verse 17, so it came to pass that when he had brought them outside, that he said, escape for your life. So they get them outside the city gate, and he goes, keep going. Do not look behind you, nor stay anywhere in the plain. Escape to the mountains lest you be destroyed. You would listen, right? You would listen if an angel told you to do something and said, it's going to be devastating. You don't want to look back and you don't want to be anywhere around here, so run and go to the mountains. You'd be like, okay. And Lot said to them, please, no, my lords. No. I'm sorry. I, I'm an angel, and I just told you what to do, and you're telling me no? What a child. No, my lords. Indeed, now your servant has found favor in your sight, and you have increased your mercy, which you have shown me by saving my life. But I cannot escape to the mountains, lest some evil overtake me, and I die. You girl. You little three-year-old. See now, the city is near enough to flee to, and, and it's a little one. Please, let me escape there. Is it not a little one? And my soul shall live. I can't go into the woods. There are animals there. I'm a city boy. 
I can't do without in, inside plumbing. <laughs> do you, what? Do you see that stuff has such a hold on his life that he can't be obedient to do what he's told directly? And his answer to them is, please, no. There's a city right here. There's a city. By the way, this is one of five cities in this plain. If you remember, the four kings of the north came south in chapter 13 and took these five cities. By the way, these five cities all have the same problem. They all have the same people. It's all the same thing. The whole plain is destined to be dusted. And he picks the littlest city and says, well, can't I just go here? It's so near and I can almost see it and I can't go to the mountains. The guys that just delivered you out of the city, they're going to level, just told you to go to the mountains. Shouldn't you go to the mountains? You should go to the mountains. Wrong. Don't question when you're given clear direction. And so they're out and they go. In Luke 18, verses 7 and 8, Jesus says this, And God shall not, and shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out to him day and night, though he bears long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. And then Jesus adds this comment. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? Jesus said, Listen, God's going to come, and when everything begins to happen, the, the, the word is tachyon. It means it's going to happen quickly. But when I come, is there going to be faith on the earth? Are there going to be people that are going to say, no, Lord, please, no. Or is he going to find people that are waiting for him, prepared and ready? Verse 21, and he said to him, see, I have favored you concerning this thing also, in that I will not overthrow this city for which you have spoken. Hurry, escape there, for I cannot do anything until you arrive there. Therefore, the name of the city is called Zor. The sun had risen upon the earth when Lot entered Zor. By the way, Zor means little one. So it takes its name from him saying, it's a little one. And suddenly that was its name, Little One. So they're like, oh good, now we get a place to go. A nice apartment on Main Street. By the way, this is what the plain looks like. This is at the south end of the Dead Sea. You may recognize it. All of this gray area once was water and the Dead Sea is drying up at um, several feet per year. I forget exactly the number but it's constantly shrinking and evaporating and becoming more salinated. But as you can see, here's where, Ab here's where Abraham was and the angels came over and they found him in Sodom. Here's Gomorrah, here's Zor, and here are the other two, Zeboim and, and Mizpah. So in all of these areas, there is brimstone found. There is soil that has been melted at such an incredible heat that it turned to glass. And you can only find this sort of material where there have been nuclear blasts. It's a rather interesting thing if you're into the archaeology. I won't bore you with all the details, but it's rather interesting. But they have found all of this in these areas over in here. So yes, it was a real thing that happened. This is not a figurative thing. This is a real thing that truly happened in history. <coughs> I want you to look at verse 22. The angels say, hurry, escape, for I cannot do anything until you arrive there. Why can't they do anything until he arrives there? Because even if there's one person in that city, they won't destroy the city. That's why Zor was saved. And what should have happened was Zor should have got leveled, but because he wanted to go there, it got spared. And so instead of five coming down, only four came down. So the problem somehow got per perpetuated. In verse 24, then the Lord rained brimstone and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. And he withdrew those cities, all the plain, all the inhabitants of the cities, 
that grew on the ground, but his wife looked back behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. You guys are familiar with this verse, I'm sure. She turned around, she looked back, and by the way, turning around and looking back isn't, you know, is there something on my shoulder? She's turning and looking and pondering and longing for the city she just left. And apparently she got dusted with all the mess that was going on and she got tied in. And it's funny, she got delivered from the judgment and she was on her way. But because she looked back, Jesus said, the one who looks back and turns his head from the plow and turns back and looks is not worthy of me. He reiterates this in the New Testament. It's a scary thing to think that there are people that may have a knowledge of who Jesus is and may even have church attendance and may even have some semblance of understanding of what the Bible says, and yet they're way too attached to this place. And when it comes time for judgment, their heart will not be for the Lord. It will be for this world, and they will perish with it. So she looks back, it said, and she becomes a pillar of salt. In Luke 17, our Lord Jesus says this, but on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and it destroyed them all. Even so, it will be in the day the Son of Man is revealed. And verse 32, very telling, remember Lot's wife. Why would Jesus make a point to say, remember Lot's wife? If it wasn't important that we remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. You see, Lot and his wife and his kids, they had to leave everything, and they could only take with them whatever they could carry. And so it's going to be for us. So what do you, is there anything that's really worth sticking around for? Is there anything that's more important than eternity? Is there anything more important than giving your life over and giving everything up and saying, Lord, here's my life, take it, make it whatever you want it to be. It's the best decision I ever made with my life, and it's changed everything. Amen? Amen. So the Lord raid brimstone, and it's rather interesting. I, uh, I found this picture online of uh, this salt pillar that isn't real, and this is called Lot's Wife by the way, and it's overlooking uh, right in the south, right on the mountains of Sodom, and it's called Lot's Wife. It's made out of sulfur and salt. It's a rather interesting thing, and there's more than just one pillar around there, but this one is very prominent on the top of the hill for everyone to see, and it's, I mean, it's a place to go. If you're anywhere in the Jordan area, uh, it's there. It's an amazing thing to me. And it stands there as a monument and as a memorial to what happens when you look back and you're too attached to things. And Abraham went early in the morning to the place where he had stood before the Lord. And he looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain. And he saw and behold, the smoke of the land which went up was like the smoke of a furnace. And it came to pass when God destroyed the cities of the plain that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overturned the cities in which Lot had dwelled. And so he goes to Zor and we see Abraham over here in Mamre over in Hebron and he's looking over here at the plain in which everything is destroyed and burning. And he sees all the cities of the plain, not just Sodom, and so I imagine the cities looked like that as opposed to just a single column of smoke. It was four columns of smoke. And so God's judgment came to them eventually. And I don't know when God draws the line and says, that's it, I'm going to unleash my judgment. But I hope to not be around like Lot. Amen? And then Lot went up out of Zor and dwelt in the mountains. What? What? Wait a minute. Hold on. He said, no, no, Lord, I can't go to the mountains. If I go to the mountains, I'm going to die. I got to go to the city. He goes, all right, go to the city. I won't destroy the city. Go ahead, go. So he goes to the city and he goes, 
I got to get out of here. After seeing the devastation, maybe he was concerned because that city had the same problem as Sodom and Gomorrah and Zeboim. And he was afraid to dwell in Zor. And he and his two daughters dwelt in a cave. Don't live in a cave. Caves aren't good in the scriptures. Elijah ends up in a cave, remember? The Lord comes to him, calls him out of the cave and says, what are you doing? He says, I'm hiding. They're going to try to kill me. He goes, you don't even know what you're talking about. I got 7,000 that haven't bowed their knee to me. What are you talking about? You're the only one. Caves are not a good place. Be careful. Saul went into a cave one time to relieve himself, almost lost his life. Caves are not a good idiom. Anyway, he was afraid to dwell in Zor, and so he and his two daughters dwelt in a cave. Certainly not city living and certainly not on the mountains. And the firstborn said to the younger, our father is old, and there is no man on the earth to come into us as is the custom of all the earth. Come, let us make our father drink wine, and we will lie with him that he may preserve the lineage of our father. What? They just were in a little city that got preserved. Why is it that they thought there was not another man on the face of the planet that would ever become their husband? Because Zor had the same problem as all the other cities did. They were loaded with homosexuals. They said, we're never going to find a man. There's not a man on the face of the earth. Every man we've seen is bent. So let's lie with our father and produce children. Not one single ew from one of you. Thank you. Right? There's two ewes. And so they dwelt in a cave, and now the girls are scheming, and it's a sexual scheming. Do you think their upbringing had anything to do with that? Do you think the twist of living in that culture had anything to do with the way that he raised his daughters? Christian principles are no longer going to be found in schools. You're not going to find them with the friends of your kids. You're going to find them when you purposely hand the torch off to them. And it can be a very difficult situation. But God bless you if you do, because it's worth it. So they're scheming. And so they made their father drink wine that night. By the way, no one makes you drink. You know that? There has to be a willingness on your behalf. And at this point, I imagine he just wants to forget his troubles and, you know, dive inside a bottle. So they made their father drink wine that night, and the firstborn went in and lay with her father, and he did not know that she lay down or when she arose. It happened on the next day that the firstborn said to the younger, Indeed, I laid with my father last night. Let us make him drink wine tonight also, so that you may go in and lie with him and that we may preserve the lineage of our father. Sounds so noble. And then they made their father drink wine that night also. And the younger arose and lay with him. And he did not know when she lay down or when she arose. He was that drunk. Thus, both the daughters of Lot were with child by their father. The firstborn bore a son and called his name Moab. And he is the father of the Moabites to this day. And the younger, she also bore a son and called his name Ben-Ami. He is the father of the people of Ammon to this day. Interesting. So these tribes were a product of incest. And they become the arch enemies of Israel for years to come. Messed up family messed up testimony. Don't let it be yours. Moab means son of my father. So glad to have ancestral relationships made sure everybody knew that he was a product of incest. He is the son of my father. That's what Moab means. Ben-Ami means 
son of my people, which is very similar. He's the son of my people. I won't say my dad, but... Jerry Springer got nothing on the Bible. There's a contrast here. You have Abraham, who with his faults and his failures, believes when God says stuff. He falls down, gets back up. He falls down, gets back up. Lot went hook, line, sinker, because he was more interested in comfort and himself and stuff than he was doing what God wanted him to do. We have a contrast with these two people. We have an example of what to do when he's not fallen and an example of definitely what we should not do because where that could end up is anybody's guess. So that's the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Likewise, also it was in the days of Lot. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. We're pointed back to that from the New Testament and saying, just like it was in the time of Lot, is the way it's going to be again. Did you notice any similarities to the society that was going on there and what's happening here in our culture? And it's happened very quickly. The Lord said when he comes back, he's going to do it very quickly. So when everything begins... The countdown is going to be very quick. If you don't have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, if you have not given over your life and said, that's it, I give up. My life isn't about me, it's about you. And I realize I'm a sinner. I have fallen short in so many ways. I am weak, I am twisted, and I need a savior. Jesus, please save me. If you have not come to the, the relationship with God that way, by confessing your sins and saying, I repent, I'm a bonehead, I need your help, save me. You can do that today. And you will escape the judgment of God. Because it will be again like it was in the day of Lot. And I don't want you to be caught inside that city. So, next week, we're going to look at deja vu all over again. Deja vu is a familiar feeling, like I've been here before, like we've done this before. And he's going to move. He's going to go about 250 miles south, and he's going to dwell in a place with a guy who's a, who's a, a king. His name is Abimelech. You might recognize his name. And he's going to move into town, and he's going to say, this woman that's with me, she's my sister. And guess what happens? It's deja vu all over again. So we're going to look at Abraham in one of his lower moments when he was there with the Lord and questioning the Lord, boy, we have a nice chunk of doctrine about how God does not punish the innocent with the guilty, but knows how to deliver the innocent and punish the guilty. Now we're going to see again that he falls short because he's afraid. In fact, both of these guys, Lot and Abraham, are full of fear. How about you? You struggle with fear? What people might think? If I told them I really believed in Jesus, my goodness, what would they say? They might say, how do I do that? We may get that opportunity. So tune in next week 